So on that note, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the moderator for our first panel today. Now, this person, Kaukie Kitari, is a key member of the Pacific Islands Council of Queensland, as well as the current president of the Tuvalu community here in Brisbane. He has a background in teaching and has spent five years teaching in high school before moving into the community development sector. And that's how his journey into an eight year engagement with the Tuvalu Association of NGOs began and how it led to his contribution as a founding member of the Tuvalu Climate Action Network. And would you believe he represents Tuvalu civil society several times at international climate change COPs, including Copenhagen in 2009. More recently, Taukie is currently studying a master's degree in global development at the Griffith University, and he hopes to graduate soon. So TK, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Stella, for the warm welcome and introduction. Again, I would like to say welcome to everyone and Talofa in my own um, indigenous language in Tuvaluan. Now, our first panel will focus on the topic of what makes, what makes our people's cultural identity, including history and place, and how is climate change impacting our cultural identity? Now for our, our first speaker for, this uh, for today, Kathy Chetnils Kitchener, she is a poet, a performance artist, and also an educator whom received international claim at the opening of the United Nations uh, Climate Summit in New York in 2014. Now, co-founder of the youth environmentalist nonprofit uh, Joe Jinkum, and dedicated to empowering the Marshallese youth on this very issue of climate change. Now, unfortunately, Kathy would not be able to present today, but we have a recording of her presentation from her uh, from the first webinar which was held in 2020 so um, we will be looking we will be watching that um, presentation by Jet, uh, Kathy and um, hopefully we'll be able to um, play that um, YouTube now it's changing the way that we plan for our development you know like when you're mm. planning and strategizing for the development of a country you don't necessarily have to think about climate change, you know, destroying your entire island and, and taking away your sovereignty. But this is how we're now planning for the future for our islands. And in terms of human rights, the Marshall Islands actually collaborated recently to uh, host a conference between the Marshall Islands, Kiribati, Tuvalu, and other members of CANCC, the Coalition of Atoll Nations, to discuss the human rights impacts of climate change mm. and you know how how what what are the intersections specifically mm. and so with within the UN human rights framework and in climate change framework the UNFCCC uh, these two realms tend to be considered separate you know in some ways which is is, is strange you know in, in uh, as far as um, kind of the, the the technical ways of intersections and so I, I completely it, it was a really it was a really interesting conference that helped us sort of highlight, first of all, the climate change impacts, but then also second of all, the ways in which we at the country level, at the national level are addressing those human rights impacts and planning for those human rights impacts. And so when we're looking at cultural rights and social rights, I think that's so hard to address, you know, in, the, in a world that basically does not recognize cultural rights and does not see the, the impacts or the, or the importance of cultural rights, you know, the social, uh, social impacts of cultural rights. I think when I, when I think about climate change and, and cultural rights, it reminds me of when I tried to explain our connection to land and a journalist, an American journalist was talking to me about it. And he said, 
Well, can you explain that more? Because for those of us who don't have that cultural connection to land, that doesn't mean anything to us. It just, you know, we wonder why can't you just pick up and leave? It's just land, you know? And so I think that kind of disconnect between that mm. connection that we have and that, and culture, what culture means to us is, is, mm. is going to make it really difficult to fight at these international realms on this, on this issue. You know, when the wider public, you know, through colonization, through globalization has essentially wiped out and, you know, culture in a lot of different ways. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's where my mind's going on those, uh, on those kinds of different topics. Yeah. I entered this kind of space as a poet, you know, as a poet that was engaging on climate change issues in, and the ways in which it was impacting me as a, as a citizen, as, as a person you know, and, and the, the fear that I felt once I started to learn how vulnerable we are and how serious climate change was. And one of the ways in which it really attracted me or one of the ways that I was drawn into the conversation initially was the ways that journalists would constantly ask, where are they gonna move? Will they still have passports? And that was the angle of questioning. And I think that when we're looking at sovereignty again, it sort of feels like jumping the gun a bit. You know, like we're not really there yet, but it still is a really important conversation to have. And so this is something that Marshall Islands has been considering. And this is something I have thought about as a Marshallese. And I use poetry and art. And as someone who grew up in the States and not on my own island, I use art to, to learn more about my culture and to learn more about the stories that connect us to that land and the ways in which culturally, you know, everyone owns land in the Marshall Islands. Everyone can, can claim a piece of land. And every piece of land has a story, has a, a, a chant, a song um, that's, you know, you can point to a coral head and it has this, you know, 100 year old story that can be passed down generation to generation. And so that tells us initially that importance of land. But as I started to learn more and more about climate change and I kept writing and I kept performing, I wanted to learn more about the technical aspects of it. I wanted to get into all of the different realms. And so when you introduce me as Kathy's a poet, she's a climate envoy, but she's a poet, but she's also the director of this nonprofit. It's because I understand that this is an intersectional issue and I want to be at every intersection, uh, you know, every sector trying to figure out how do all of these pieces fit? Because at the end of the day, climate change is this huge problem and it has to engage us at every level. And so, um, you know, for me as a poet, I write to, to engage my feelings, to engage my emotions and to, you know, to stay connected to the issue. That's what keeps me grounded and keeps me going when we're looking at such a huge problem. But I also work with our youth through our nonprofit, Jochi Gum, I make sure we organize that we're engaging them as well because they're gonna be the ones inheriting the issue. Um, and then at the, and then at, of course, in my newest capacity, something I'm really just getting into now is as climate envoy. And so within this role, I've been working with our government and with our ministers to make sure that, um, to just advise and also represent our country at various climate change events and, um, and to also help our national, uh, our national climate change directorate team in developing our national adaptation plan. So I think what's really important that I really want to get you know, through to people through this webinar is that um, there is important work that is happening on the ground level that is very technical and very um, valuable. You know, we're not just sitting here being victims. We're not just sitting here waiting for the tides to come and wash us away. We are advocating at an international level, but we're also, um, we're also doing the day-to-day -day work of meetings and strategizing and answering these hard questions, one of them being sovereignty. And I would say that the most, the clearest way that we're protecting ourselves and we're protecting our sovereignty at this moment is through the National Adaptation Plan. And so Marshall Islands for the past couple of years has been focused on mitigation, promoting mitigation, making sure everyone was curbing their emissions. We developed an energy roadmap to eliminate fossil fuels and transition to renewable energy by 2050. Very, very forward thinking. And we did that first. We know we're one of the first countries to implement that and to also submit our NDCs, our nationally determined contributions. But then we realized, you know, some, a scientist came here, his name is Dr. Chip Fletcher, and gave us really startling climate science that told us that 
we can no longer just plan for mitigation. We had to plan for the worst. We had to start adapting. And so that's what we're working on right now is that national adaptation plan, the NAP, which we're also calling our survival plan. The Marshall Islands is only two meters above sea level. So that means there's no mountains, there's no larger island to go to. We as Atoll Nations all, all kind of share that identity, that vulnerability. The latest uh, science that we've been given is that the best estimates we've been given is that sea level, is that there'll be a sea level rise of 5.9 feet in 80 years. So that's all of the Marshall Islands submerged in 80 years because we're only two meters above sea level, which is about six feet, right? So what you have to also remember is that RMI contributes 0.00001% of the world's global emissions. And so what you're seeing is the worst impacts in the region to to all, all atoll nations from the countries that contribute the least. So the National Adaptation Plan is... Uh, is the way we're going to protect ourselves, you know, and some of that is going to be extreme solutions. And some of those extreme solutions are building islands, elevating islands. And then it becomes, where do we get that funding? How will we decide where we will, be, we will build the islands? Which islands will be elevated? Which communities will be moved? What will happen to our cultural um, protocols of land ownership? Lots and lots and lots of questions, but the National Adaptation Plan is the first step towards answering that question. And so that begins first with statements of situation, gathering reports from all of the different sectors. How will your sector of education be impacted by climate change? Well, we have this amount of schools on this number of islands. How will, you know, maybe they'll uh, end up becoming shelters for when there's, you know, high tide floodings. And then gathering all of the science that we have so far. You know, so far, most of the science that we have comes from something called the Reymalak framework. The Reymalak framework is conservation focused and it has some adaptation in it, but you can only conserve to a certain point before the whole island disappears, right? And so that's another part of it too. And so we have that science, but not enough. And so I think that what we're really, the questions that we're asking ourselves is listen to and what science is going to inform how we plan for the future. But at the end of the day, we don't want to leave and we don't want to move. You know, I'm, I'm kind of like, um, I, I feel like I'm seeing a, a line from one of my poems, but that's the truth. And I think all of us in the Atoll Nations collectively agree that migration isn't, shouldn't be the only option. It shouldn't be forced migration. So the National Adaptation Plan is our best bet towards making sure that our shorelines are protected, that our community is protected, and that our sovereignty is protected. You know, it's really important that we maintain that sovereignty. Uh, as someone who grew up as an immigrant out in the March, you know, in the U.S., I know how difficult it is to grow up, to live in the diaspora. And to think of thousands of us, you know, having to be forced to make that transition, that it won't work, especially with, especially when you're looking at the U.S. right now with its current uh, immigration policies and, you know, the uh, with with the outright racism towards people of color and immigrants also. So, I guess these are all different things we're taking into consideration. I think I I just wanted to emphasize that that we are here, we're doing the work, and that while migration is an option, we are doing everything we can to protect our sovereignty. At the end of the day, we can't rely on the rest of the world anymore, and I think that's where we're at. That was a very interesting um, presentation, and I think some of the takeaways from that um, presentation is that. Climate change is a multi-sectoral uh, issue that needs to be viewed, to be seen, and to be addressed at every level and every sector. Now, one other, the other thing that came very strongly out of this is that uh, presentation, is that the Marshall Island people do not want to move. Okay? They do not want to move at all. And migration is not an option for them. And that means, the Marshall Island people are also doing a lot of adaptation um, activities or planning so that they can live as long as they want on their, or as long as they can on their small island, the Marshall Islands. Now there's a lot more coming. So I will move on to the next um, presentation. And I hope that we will learn more about the experiences of our uh, two other present presenters 
And to, to continue on, our second pre um, presenter is Mr. Mai Natalia from Tuvalu. Now, Maina is currently completing a doctoral studies at the Charles Sturt uh, University in Sydney, specifically uh -huh. uh, focused on the issue of Tuakoi, which is a Tuvaluan word, which means neighbor and climate change from uh, three trajectories, indigenous wisdom, biblical and geopolitics. Now, without further ado, I'll let Maina talk about his um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Afaftaitaukye. Uh, Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be part of this very important discussion in relation to cultural identity and, um, and sovereignty. My presentation is entitled, Cultural Identity in the Face of Climate Crisis, the Case of Tuvalu. Um, because of time is not on our side, I will jump, jump straight into my presentation. Given the unfavorable consequences of climate change related sea level rise, I'll be focusing on why it is important to maintain our cultural identity in the face of climate crisis. Culture is defined as a symbol that expresses meaning, including beliefs, rituals, arts, and stories that created, uh, create collective outlooks and behaviors and from which strategies to respond to problems and devised, are devised and implemented. It has both non-materials and material aspect, and is often closely tied to places, physical spaces that are given meaning by people, even as both have become increasingly transnationalized through the process of globalization. To discuss the importance of cultural identity, communalism must be at the heart of this discussion. We cannot take Tuvalu with us, but our sense of humor, our intangible way of life that label us as Tuvaluans can be practiced and lived on foreign soils. However, there must be a place where you can identify yourself. It makes no sense to say that I am from Tuvalu without making any reference to the geographical location of your roots. Thus, the logic is very simple. If we continue to protect our land from submerging, we are protecting our identity, who we are and what makes us Tuvaluans. If we lose our land to the sea, we are losing life and identity. Muna de Fale or traditional knowledge. There is no Tuvaluan word for indigenous knowledge. Hence, I have published and popularized the phrase Muna de Fale, literally means word of wisdom, to mean indigenous knowledge. Living or having a fale, a house, is a symbol of validity, sacred, and renewability of peace and well being. Fale is where cultural wisdom is being taught and passed on to the next generation. It is through the fale where we are taught the significance of looking after our fenua, our land, Moana, and our umanga, traditional plantation. Gaining such knowledge will give you cultural status, which determines your manhood. Our society functions under the power of aliki, chiefs who decides what is best for our community. In Waitubu, take it for example, a man is qualified to speak in a Falegao Bule, a traditional meeting place, on the condition that he has repre or represent a Mataaniu, a saving institution. This traditional concept of Mataaniu directly links us to land. Land is sacred. And in the Pacific countries, land tends to have meaning to those who belong or are part of it that are often difficult to capture in the English or other colonial languages. There are many Tuvaluan words that describe land. Fenua, Fanua, Laukele, Manafa, Potu, Nuku, and Dia. The word Fanua in its literal meaning is equivalent to the word placenta. Fanua is spelled slightly different from the word Fenua, but with a parallel meaning. Sia Song has the following words to say. Without land, there is no life and destiny. A bond of life is forged between the land, those who work on it, land and us, we and land. Land, uh, this bond of life is forged by God. We live in land and land lived in us. In the Fenua, the dead are buried. When a Tuvaluan speak of land, they speak with respect to the living and the dead. 
Land cannot be discussed as just a mere piece of land. For us, land is life because land cannot be bought nor be sold. It's being passed on and passed down through generations. During tropical cyclone Pam in 2015, there were about 90 to 100 graveyards were unearthed. Our elders holding, hold the strong conviction that there must be a message for us. And the message is simple, please, do not dare to leave us behind. Through cultural practices reflected in our languages, we are culturally bonded to land. This land is not easily, or this bond is not easily disregarded. This land is the same land in which our ancestors laid to rest, they are just resting. If we are to live, we must take them with us. Each Tuvaluan has their own story to tell of their fenua, fanua, their placenta, and their pito, umbilical cord. It is a place, a place where we long to be near to. To disconnect this relationship with our fenua is to lose life for us. Land identifies who is a people and a community. Land, fenua, fanua, vanua, etc., is where our culture, language, and com communal values are rooted. In, the, in his article, Danny Halliday argues that before exploring what makes for a successful climate change migration in the Pacific, it must first be established why the case of Pacific migration is especially complicated. Why is it different from any other type of migration, developing country or not? The concern is mainly due to the fact that Pacific, when or for the Pacifica to leave their land means their culture must live in memory. For indigenous people in general, relocation come with many negative effects, including a break in ties of the sense of place and identity, self-efficiency, rights to land and culture, and bridging the bonding capital that is often derived from physical places and losing access to common property resources. Communalism is the apex of Tuvaluan and any other culture. The likely loss of culture and tradition of low-lying atolls due to climate change is a grave concern. Renowned Tuvaluan academic Fewe Tipu clearly points out the importance of section two of the constitution of Tuvalu that refers to the upholding of cultural values, both present and future, depends very largely on the maintenance of Tuvaluan values, culture and traditions. Moreover, the constitution declares that the people of Tuvalu seek to maintain their traditional forms of community, the strength and the support of community and community discipline. Our cultures and traditions were socially constructed and formulated based on the paucity of our resources. Conceptually, this shapes the ways we live and do things. It is best illustrated in our communal living, which is the apex of our social order. Communalism is common throughout the Pacific. Upolulumavai alluded to this. Communal living was part of our religious belief system. Life oriented around the belief that in fishing, constructing, planting, harvesting, eating, or deciding. In Oceania, communion and relationship was the goal of life. Our social, political, economic, and religious orders are shaped around the prime ideal of communal living. This give birth to fa'alo alo and ava, respect and alofa, love, which orients in the center of the, our total being. Our identity as Tuvaluans is defined and shaped by our communal living. We are very conscious of our family reputation and family dignity. We shall not commit any act that humiliate and bring shame to the family. Community for us is the pinnacle of life. Sir Philomia Delito rightly put it, Tuvalu traditional society operates mainly on communal life basis. This means that the whole pattern of lifestyle whether politically, socially, economically, or religiously oriented, is basically lived according to communal principles. A typical example that resonates with Delito's um, understanding of community is the concept of ngalue fakangamua. Ngalue fakangamua means free labor or voluntary work provided by members of the community for family, groups, the church, and so forth. No other institution on the island have the power to summon 
de yengalwenga fakangamua, only the kaingaliki, which is the chief of the island. The men, young and old, would provide materials and labor, while the women provide food from the beginning to the end of the project. Refusing to attend ngalwenga fakangamua voluntary labor will result in fakafolau, they will chase you away. Go and find a place to live if you do not agree with what, with what uh, uh, has been prescribed by our culture. The spirit of community and togetherness is greatly displayed in the art of Fadele, our traditional singing and dancing. All of our Fadeles were composed to unite and strengthen community values and shared responsibilities by keeping community intact. One of the significant elements of communalism is the fact that you are obligated to share with your tuakoi to share unity and peace with the island setting that also upheld. This system of life can be described as a free exchange of goods without the expectation of receiving something, something in return. The exchange of goods goes beyond the concept of market, the buying and selling concept. If a family gives you your neighbor, um, their neighbors a basket of fish today, tomorrow they may receive a green uh, basket of green coconut. Sharing of local resources among the people never result in poverty. That's why you don't find poverty in Tuvalu, only hardship. On the governance level, Falekaubule, community meeting hall, is described as the access of community life. Falekaubule, or traditional meeting hall, typically built in the center of the island next to the sea. The wealth and the security of island are deliberated in the Falekaubule. Decisions made in the Falekaubule are final and cannot be challenged due to its role as the supreme authority over traditional governance. Falekaubule Games is viewed as the center that houses are strictly observes our cultural values, norms, and individual responsibility. I will try to sum up. Being exposed to the effect of globalization and climate change challenge the concept of community and other associated elements of our culture that hold the community together. The gradual invading of our space by even individualism force our people to be concerned more of themselves than with the other. The unpredictability of drought and the change in weather patterns have affected the people's interest in sharing and caring for the other. As communal principles have gradually lost their values throughout the years, people have come to question the authority of Aliki. They have lost interest in serving the community, especially with the introduction of human rights which makes them believe that they, are, they have the liberty to choose for their own individual benefit. In reality, it's a no-no. There is no such thing called individual rights. All we know is communal rights that exist and ascribed in our being and runs in our blood. Your individual rights are limited and restricted to your own house only. Thus, this understanding of communal rights has been challenged in principle, but not in practice. However, what is most important here is the aspect of non-economic loss and damage or intangible culture, which is irreplaceable and cannot be measured in economic, term, economic terms. And this is the fear that our people carry, the fear of lo losing their cultural values. Our infinite and invaluable culture and identity go beyond conventional uh, terms. Culture of a cultural identity to a person. It identifies you as a Tuvaluan, where you belong. There is no point of surviving when you no longer have a fenua, an island, or land where all culture and traditions are rooted. Life is point pointless when you no longer have a place to call home. Our culture is tied to our fenua, where our umbilical cords and our placentas are buried, and our forefathers a sole owner, and they also laid to rest. Likewise, the Galicia Galiciano Tuvalu theological statement emphasized the same feeling towards land and cultural identity, and I quote, it is in our land that we find our identity, the bond with those who have gone before us and where practice what it means, where we practice what it means for us to live with one another in a community. To lose one's cultural identity is to lose life. In conclusion, let's take Tuvalu immigrants in New Zealand. 
for example. The first initiative they took was to build a hall, to be the center of worship and social gathering, a place where they can sing their Tuvalu hymns and dance their Tuvalu and Fatele. Life is inc incomplete without congregating. Singing and dancing Fatele gives them a sense of home, community and togetherness. It is a moment of reflection and thinking of home, the place where their fanua and umbilical cords are buried, a place where their cultural identity animates from. That is why keeping Tuvalu above the sea is significant, and it gives people a point of reference, a geographical point of reference on the map to be called home, Tuvalu. We must have a point of reference, a place where we can point to our children and generation to come. This is home. That is home, where our cultural identity animated. Not having a home qualifies a person to be called homeless. And it is the same logic that applies to a person without a country. You can be a refugee here in Australia, but you still have a home, a point of reference to point to. Our special bond with our land and sea cannot be dismantled. And this is what makes it difficult for us to live to Walu. Land plus community gives cultural identity. Plus God, it gives life and happiness. Thank you. Thank you, Maina. That was a very um, powerful presentation. Again, Maina, thank you for sharing your rich knowledge on, um, on, the, on this topic. And I think some of the um, takeaways from this, from Maina's uh, presentation is that um, cultural identity is through the so-called communalism. It's innate. Uh, inscribed in our being and runs through our blood. And also cultural identity is tied to land where our fenua or fanua or placenta or pito, which is the umbilical cord are buried. Now I can really relate to this because myself, when I was born, my umbilical cord was cut into two. One was buried under a coconut tree on land and the other, my father took it. And, um, and throw it in the ocean. This brings two things together, land and, and, and ocean into one place, which Maina has alluded uh, strongly in his um, presentation. So the logic is very simple. We continue to protect our land from submerging. We are protecting our identity who we are and what makes us Tuvaluans. If we lose our land to the sea, we are losing life and identity. Our special bond with our land and sea cannot be dismantled. And this is what makes it difficult for us to leave Tuvalu. The land plus community gives cultural identity plus God, it gives life. Thank you again, my Natalia for your very rich knowledge and presentation. And I would like to welcome our third uh, presenter for, for today. And we are so very fortunate to have uh, Tereao Teingia Raisite from Kiribati. Now Tereao is currently working with the University of the South Pacific has a strong connection with community service organizations in and around Kiribati. And without further ado, tear out uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, uh, Mr. Chair. And um, I'm Terea Teinia Rasite from Kiribati, and I'm, I'm the president of the, the Kiribati. And uh, with my presentation uh, entitled the, the Climate Change Challenges to Cultural Identity and Sovereignty of Pacific Atoll Nations, I'll be base my talk more on the on Kiribati as well as the Kango. Um, 
if you have my my presentation, I'll just go over to the to the questions then. And and the questions I have here are that the first one is what makes up a people's cultural identity, including history and place. And the next one is how is climate change impacting cultural identity? And to overall all of this, I would try to answer the climate change challenges, the cultural identity and sovereignty of Pacific or of Kiribati, of the Kiribati nation. And um, with my outline, I will talk first on the background of Kiribati. As you know, there are three main islands that you. Okay. Um, I did put in a disclaimer early, remember, in the introduction, that some of our people in the Blue Pacific would be having possibly connectivity problems. So this is part of how it just is at the moment. Um, I don't know if people would like to go to a break now. Question. Or we'll go to questions. Um, and so, TK, um, I leave it in your hands to take us to questions while we uh, sort out the technology aspect of our connectivity to Terea. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Stella. And I think um, as we have um, Maina sitting in our, our only panelist at the moment, but I think this um, opportunity will be, we'll take this opportunity to ask um, some of the uh, questions. How much? identity links to a specific globalized glo global location, latitude, longitude, thus sea and local climate, as well as land. In that case, is a floating island solution some form of link in the worst possible or worst case scenario? Is, do you have any um, comment on that, uh, Mr. Mai Natalia? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the question. I think it's very pertinent, especially uh, we are trying to search for solutions. But um, as culture evolves, you know, and also the mentality and um, the framework of thinking also change. So it depends how we look into it, especially when, you know, when, we, when it comes to the uh, question of floating islands, for example. But that's something that we don't want to pursue right now. What we want to pursue is the saving of our islands. Because, I mean, building new islands or floating islands, that's possible. Nothing impossible now, in nowadays, when it comes to money and technology. You know, they, they, they have the knowledge, technology, and the money. But what we want to pursue and push forward is the saving of our islands. So I think we, we need to concentrate on how best we can save our island, and how best we can maintain um, the continuity of life and the continuity of our cultural identity as Tuvaluans, not on floating islands. Thank you. There's another question that came up, and this is regarding um, organizations or person identified what the rest of the world needs to do to make sure that the atoll nations do not go under underwater or under waves. Has any organization or person identified what the rest of the world needs to do. Um, okay, do I have to answer that or anyone in the group can also um, yes. join? Because I, I think what you guys are doing, I mean, your organization and organization throughout the world have pointed out. I think we are repeating the same message that our what our forefathers been in political arena for the past years. You know, we've been telling the same story over and over again. Stop banning fossil fuels. So we're, we're trying to address at the same time the costs of climate change because migration and displacement does not solve any issue. You know, we, Australia can just bring few ships to Tuvalu and take the hundred or other 10 plus thousand people and bring them to Sydney or somewhere else. But what we are trying to address is the cost of climate change, which will result in people being displaced from their home uh, islands. So the message I think is very clear from the past years up until now, and also the core work that you guys are doing, the Pacific Island Council of Queensland, 
and so as other NGOs around Australia and in the Pacific, that please stop burning fossil fuels. Thank you. Yes, uh, certainly. And I guess that's um, the, the whole idea that we're, we're bringing this, this issue and the discussion around um, any issues, concerns to um, that's related to climate change. And I think as uh, passionate climate uh, change um, activist. Mm -hmm. It is our responsibility for our future generations to really bring this issue up for for debate. And I think it is it's it's a long overdue thing that we, it needs to be discussed. But at least the conversation doesn't need to stop. It needs to to be maintained and continued on um, for in the near future. The one other question that came up, is there any discussions or, and or research around maintaining living shorelines in adaptation? And this can be answered by um, some of us too on this, on this board. You're under pressure, Maina. No, I'm not <laughs> under pressure. No, I'm just, You're under I the want pump. to be in the spotlight all the time. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, maybe I can. Good for um, other people to take part as well. I'm sure that there are lots of people in our audience online who would have some great comments to contribute. Yes. At this point in our conversation, um, in terms of what uh, Kathy has said in the um, YouTube video that we saw, and in terms of what Maina has had to say. Um, I think the emphasis on survival is what we're considering seriously here because of the intersect too. When we're talking about sovereignty and we're talking about climate change, survival, there is that tension in my mind. There is that tension. I know that there are some of our uh, Pacific our countries who are building their shorelines, you know, in terms of, and I'm sure you know this too, Maina, in terms of planting more mangrove and, you know, other such nurseries for our fish life and all the rest of it, lots and lots of work going on. But the thing that really, really um, I find heartbreaking is that although we have been on this road for many, many decades, our voices are still not being heard. Although we do have advocates who try to provide advice on those different areas that um, uh, Kathy referred to, we are still not really, really as Pacifica people being heard. So I may have taken our conversation in a, a little bit of a different direction, but if there is anybody in our uh, audience um, who wants to talk about some of the work that is being done on our atolls that you are aware of, please, this is the time to share your wisdom and our knowledge with the rest of our audience. Yeah, so that's, that's absolutely right, um, um, Stella. Um, I, I think I'll take one more question and then we might have to break up for, um, for short refreshment. Uh, this question is specifically for you. All right, I think we're, sorry, I think we are on online again with um, our presenter. So let's give her the yes. opportunity now. Kango was fortunate to have a, a project called um, the Kiribati's Voices for Dignity and Resilience. And uh, this was funded by Commonwealth, the Commonwealth Fund through Biango, the, the Pacific Island Association of NGOs, as you, you already know. From the project, uh, we've got the, the cultural, um, cultural impacts, which were very sensitive to the people. And these are the key findings. And these are the, uh, based on the environment, economic uh, development, trade and commerce, um, infrastructure, freshwater and sanitation, fisheries and food security, agriculture and food security, health, education, and human resources, as well as human rights and 
the last but not the least was policies. And then now I'll, I'll just carry you along to, to the question again, what makes up a people's culture identity, including history and, and place? It says that um, the people's cultural identity, including history and place, are through their myths and legends. And if I can um, share with you the, the one of the myths and legends um, from Kiribati, and it's the creation story or legend. The Kiribati god called Nario in his work of creations gave existence and life of all things and beings up in the universe, down on earth and on surface of oceans and down to the core and pillars of earths and oceans. When creating the islands, he called them Tungaru. He proclaimed the following, I created and called you Tungaru and you will continue to be Itungarungaru. And such words of Nadeo, the creator, implies that the people of Tungaru, as known now as Kiribes, will live happily and unconditionally, meaning they shall never leave their home and motherland Tungaru. The word Tungaru is a given name to those small and tiny islands. And the word itself denotes that this group of islands are in the center of the world and act as the word Tunga. And the word Tunga really means a stopper, stopper or black to prevent the rising sea level or sea waters rising from the underneath as through there is a hole underneath the ground level of the ocean and being on the top of the hole in our capacity as the Tunga. We are the only race of people that know where the Tunga is, hence we can only be threatened and suffered the consequence of being flooded if only we move ourselves away from the hole, meaning that being the Tunga ourselves, being in the center of the world, being surrounded by the lands of Imetang or foreigners or neighborhood islands, known as Metang, our geographical location is the determiner of what to happen to our fate and the fate of the old world. Okay, that's our, another myth and legends. It's the Maniaba story. And as you know, the Maniaba is a big hall, a gathering hall for the people. And usually every village on the island has a maniaba. The maniaba is of two words. It's of two words and the words are mania and ape. Literally translated or literally means encompassing. Mania is encompassing or enfolding. And ape is as the people or land. It can be Idiomatically translated as a, a building meant to encompass all people or all island, all islands, meaning that people on all islands are encompassed or cared for in a Maneba system at their villages level, as each level has its own Maneba, and at an island or islands level, people of the fact that the Maneba encompasses or cares for all the people. Also, the island level illustrates the notion that decisions that contribute to the welfare and well-being of the people concerned to live within the Maori Teroi Te Tapumua, which really means health, peace, and prosperity are made under the roof of such building. This affirms that the Maniaba is a law-making building. To understand this, we must investigate its structure. And the structure believing that our people started off as ants or ghosts, and then 
Ansimel Meta or kind of half ghost and half people, human beings, and finally becomes our Meta, which means people. They are always dwell with us in our special place, the Maniaba, the Maniaba, and their respective places, the upper portion and lower portion. As people occupy the ground portion of the Maniaba, and see the ghosts and semi ghosts or half ghosts and half people, uh, they occupy the upper portion, overseeing us all from above. The upper, the upper portion where Ansi dwell or the ghosts dwell involves thatches and knots and timbers forming the skeletal part of the mania. The lower portion, which is rectangular, is divided and allocated to different clans within the, the, the village. In their legitimate sitting place is called the Bossi. Each clan has an old man called the Batwa, who inherits such a title to sit in his, at the forefront on behalf of his clan because of his lineage in being a man from the oldest clan and in, in front of everyone. It is believed that the center of the Maneba is rectangular where all that were, or all these old men, they are called wise old men because they've got wisdom. They are noble and they make decision for everybody in the Maneba. Whatever is being decided in the Maneba cannot be, um, um, cannot be um, against, uh, cannot go, anyone cannot go against this um, decision making. The Maneba is central as a weaving instrument to pull and push the fabric, the fabric to create an awesome dress. Uh, that's um, an idiom way of um, um, explaining the Maneba. So that's the, that's our, it's through the myths and legends, as well as the, um, oh, another one is about the Ometa. The Ometa, when, um, the Ometa is really the person and the Ometa in, in Kiribati, in a Kiribati culture or tradition, you can be called the Ometa if you have lands, intangible, tangible properties, which they would uh, help the, the family survive. If you don't have lands, firstly, the lands, which is very important, and then other tangible and intangible properties, then you cannot be called the Ometa. So everyone really wants to be called the Ometa. And in each family, the old people brought up the children to become really people like real people or meta. Otherwise, if they are not taught values, cultural, cultural skills and knowledge, they cannot be full people. <clears throat> okay, another one, the, the Maneba. Again, the Maneba uh, plays a role of um, in their legislation meeting house, uh, the, they make decisions and people, the Ometa will sit there in the Maneba, knowing what to do for the welfare of the, the, the each clan of the families. Another question here, which I really want to ponder on is, uh, how is climate change impacting cultural identity? And yes, from our from the project that gave me for the R project, we've already got the, the the findings, and all the findings that I've already um, mentioned about the. In a way that the people that were selected or the islands which were identified to to take part in the project. They gave the correct, um, the similar ideas to other, other projects that has been done in throughout Kiribati. So climate change is a reality now. 
And for the, for example, like what we've done in our project that gave you for DR, it's about, it is based on climate induced. Okay, I think we've just um, hit another roadblock there with some uh, technical um, difficulties from, from Kiribati. But um, to continue on, I think, I think we might still need to take some, some questions. And I think there is one specifically for my Natalia. And I think the, the question goes, in the case of Tuvalu, has the impacts of climate change affected cultural uh, identity by leading more to more individualism as opposed to communalism? I think that there are two elements I could uh, respond to this question. First, um, the introduction of, of refrigeration in Tuvalu around the 80s to the 90s. That's when they start introducing um, refrigeration to, to island communities. And that's when the idea of, you know, confinement started to, to arise. You know, people who go fishing, you know, it's for them normally in the culture that it's about sharing with, with Tuahoi, with their neighbors. And by the introduction of refrigeration, you know, people started thinking inwardly. They start putting the fridge, uh, the fish into the fridge for the next day. You know, that, that, that mentality and the idea of individualism starts sinking into their mindset. And the second part would be uh, the introduction of human rights. You know, they, 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 the people started to know that, you know, they have the rights not to, to attend any community um, work. And of course it does affect the, and oppose the idea of communalism. Uh, say for example, in, in 2016, there was a case on my island. Um, they were building a church and another person was, you know, he said, I have the rights not to attend because I have all the rights. And then what, what happened, the, the, the chief and the island um, exile him, chase him away from the island not allowed to come back to the island, go and find another place that you want to, 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 to comply with what the, 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 the rules and, and so forth. So, so these are the, some of the uh, implications that, you know, the, the fading of communalism in, within community. But even when we talk about um, climate change, of course it does. You know, the limited of resources, people are starting thinking of, of themselves only rather than sharing with the community. It is, it is a very important, um... Um, statement there, Maina, because there are a lot of things that are, um, especially with the changing in climate and the changing in, in our world at the moment, we are living in a world that actually not static. We are evolving and we are changing. And that's the thing that can have impact on our cultural identity and our sovereignty. And with this topic, we're talking about the impact of climate change to our, our so sovereignty and also our cultural identity. And it is very important, it's paramount that these needs to be addressed, not just at the local level, but I can also, it, it needs to be addressed and discussed at a much bigger level from cultural level to, um, national level to regional level to international level. These all, this needs to be addressed throughout those different levels. And it is paramount that we have to, to keep on talking about this. And I think we can't just stop here. And I think maybe this is not the, actually the end of our, our discussion about this topic. There will be coming times where we will will be coming back again to this sort of arena and maintain the topic and keep talking about this topic. Anything you want to add, uh, Stella? No, I think um, Maina has actually done a fantastic job for us um, in terms of covering all the topics that uh, we really wanted to hear about. I'm really apologetic about our speaker from Tarawa, Kiribati, not being able to um, 
sorry, not being able to join us in the way that you have been able to, uh, Maina. Um, we're just searching for a few more questions that have come to us from our audience. So Maina, if you're okay with it, if you don't mind staying with us for a little bit longer here to be able to address a few more questions that may come to you uh, from uh, TK um, before we go to our break. Um, there is one more question to be posed. If I can just make a very quick uh, observation in relation to um, Kathy, you know, in, in terms of, I, th I think we, we share the same sentiment in terms of, you know, people in Tuvalu also hold strong to that same position. You know, migration is a definite no, but it's a matter of choice. People have their choice to go or to stay. But at the same time, we should also have options like option B, C, and D, at least in price, you know, because when we cannot wake up in the, in the morning and half of the population is gone, then who shall we blame, the politicians or us? You know, we, we, we should at least have plan B, C, and D in place. Because when we talk about trans uh, boundaries, crossing borders, it's not something easy, you know, we cannot just deal with Australia overnight and then the following week, Tuval will be here. You know, it takes time to negotiate. It takes time to, to deal with those legal, uh, legalities and the complexities of trans boundaries issues. So I think, yeah, I'm, we were in line with what Kathy has um, outlined. And we should also push our government to at least have plan B, C, D, and so forth. At least we have a plan in place. Thank you. Absolutely. Mine, I'm really um, grateful that you have raised that particular aspect of this um, conversation because for many, many years, it has been a very deep concern of mine in relation to if people were to become uh, climate change migrants, you know, and getting lost in what I call Palangi world, where you may be stuck in a community that does not understand your culture, your value, your beliefs, your stories. How do we survive in a situation like that when all other options have failed? Any comments from you about that? Yes, yes, yes. I think um, there, is, there are options. There are also political and um, uh, academic options available on the table when it comes to, to those issues. Especially, especially, I think um, um, there was a concept called uh, nation exidu. I think Dauge is very familiar with it from uh, Maxine Bracat, Bracat or Bracat from from the University of Hawaii. Sorry for yeah that concept. You know, like um, we can operate to how how possible is uh, country A operate within country B. You know, we're having all the full rights and, you know, you know, those kind of options, at least we have those options on the table, despite the fact that we don't want to pursue them. You know, but when, 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 when worse come to worse, we have some option on the side that we can refer to. But I think that that concept developed by, um, yeah, the nation exidu concept by um, Maxine, I think, yeah, from the University of Hawaii, she's a lawyer. Yeah, I think that is another possible um options we can look into it and see how uh realistic it is when it when we put it to um into practice yes thank you Myla. um and i think it is very timely that we discuss about this because these are some of the options probably that we can come up with and also there are other many other options that are out there that we need to explore. Now, final questions for you, for, for, for you, Maina. Um, is there a possibility to have a communal interpretation of human rights instead of the individualistic one you criticized? Can, can, can you repeat that, Okay, please? Okay, the question is, is there a possibility to have a communal interpretation of human rights instead of the individualistic one you that you alluded to earlier on. Okay, yes, uh, thank you. I mean, being born and brought up in the island and, you know, raised in the island, 
I think we haven't seen any problem to do with communalism or communal rights, collective rights. Uh, it's only when this very uh, narrow uh, interpretation of human rights were brought into the to, for, to our setting, not just in Tuvalu, but in, in other Pacific Islands as well that are operated under co colonialism, uh, communalism, sorry. And that's when these people start thinking, you know, that, you know, we have these rights, but I think there is no, you know, there is no impact, you know, no negative effect of um, collective rights or communal rights. You know, we've been operating it from, from communal rights ever since the existence of, of Tuvalu. And we don't see people are being sidelined. There is no such thing clause called, you know, um, we classify different people. Although we, you know, when it comes to land, we have vakalunga, vakalalo, but that doesn't, you know, um, cross any borders or, you know, really push other people to the margin. We are all bound in the same um, principles, same governing um, principle for Muno de Falle and, and so forth. So I think I have no further comments when it comes to collective rights, shared responsibilities, and, you know, and as we try to negate the understanding of individualism. All right, all right. Thank you, uh, Maina, and thank you for all your um, contribution for today's um, uh, session. And I think it is, I think we, we, we are at the, at the point where we're gonna um, wrap this up and now we'll pass the, um, the, the baton to our MC, um, Stella. So thank you very much for, for your contributions. Thanks, TK. Maina? Thank you so much for, you know, bearing with us all the way through, carrying the brunt of the questions that have been posed. Uh, and then to everybody, I apologize for the hiccups we've had to endure, um, but I'm hoping you will stick with us for the rest of the sessions that we have today. And it is now, of course, time to take a break to rest the old eyes, have a stretch, enjoy a quick refreshing drink. So for, most of you, it'll be 20 minutes, and we'll see you back here, say 2.50. On the dot, 2.50, you've got it. We shall reconvene. So we look forward to seeing you back then. Don't go away. <laughs> <laughs>